It's kind of a little bit weird. I have to stick with my notes today, which is nail biting, because I'm notorious for producing copious notes and then <laughs> taking off. And then coming back later and saying, wow, did I, did, did I not say that? <laughs> no, I didn't, because I just left the notes behind. So if you see me doing a lot of looking and reading today, it's because it's imperative I follow what I've put together. This time of year, as most of you know, elicits fantastic news articles and papers on the person of Jesus. I mean, if you go anywhere, you're at least going to see one magazine or two with Jesus' face on it. I guess it's an attempt to lure the curious, but it's always with a twist. All of it usually is done in design to basically make people who do not read the Bible, who have vague understanding of God's word, to make them question and doubt even more and say, well, you see, this is all the reason why I can't believe. If the headlines aren't to make him the father of somebody's children, they are to marginalize him as a prophet amongst many. If we're legitimately asking questions about this man from Galilee and putting him as the scriptures paint him as king with a future kingdom, it would be really good for us, and I say us as the church, to take a look at some of the more famous scholars and their deduction, what they've come up with, uh, in terms of Christ as king and kingdom. And let me, before I begin, say this is an important subject. I've touched on this in, in more simplistic ways, but this is an important subject for all Christians to look at and examine carefully. For if we are people of the book, you cannot ignore if he is king, and eventually he will come back as king of kings, lord of lords, establish a kingdom here on earth where he will be with those who are in his kingdom, it really behooves us to understand what that means in the now. Now, there are notable scholars. I start with probably, I say the best of them, as in the least terrible interpretation. Giza Vermes, who is probably read by many contemporary students of the Bible. He saw Jesus as a charismatic teacher and an exorcist in a soon-to-be-realized kingdom. Put a period there, a good start, but that's all it was, was a good start. And you have people the likes in historical scholarship like Albert Schweitzer and Joanne Seiss, who were right to oppose the popular view that the kingdom of God is simply where departed loved ones go when they die. But where they went wrong is they basically depicted that the coming of the kingdom ushered in the end of the world. That is something that uh, I'm not even going to touch that. People who influenced American Christianity, like Ralph Waldo Emerson, who greatly had such an impact, his theory was the kingdom is simply spiritual and inward. Now, again, there are part truths, but this does not make the whole. And these are really probably some of the highest uh, scholarly writers we, I could dig up. The German exegete, Bultmann and his followers like Barth, they found Jesus to be a misguided hero preaching a kingdom that would never come. And out of their preaching came a whole universe of people who feared if Christianity was scrutinized, if anybody dare probe and ask what would happen to the faith, it could potentially collapse. By the way, that's, that's a straw house and a straw argument. The 20th century brought about a different approach, what I have labeled investigative theology, that basically forces Jesus to be understood first and foremost with regards to king and kingdom from a Judaic concept. And when I say this, don't go running away with what I just said. It's imperative, actually, that we understand his kingdom and his kingship in the Jewish mindset first, if it can be even understood or approached that way, to get a really deeper sense. We don't need to just simply camp out in the New Testament. There's such an abundance of material in the Old Testament. And this is what's unfortunate. You have so much material in the Old Testament that points crystal clear 
to king and kingdom to come. The question is, how could so many people of the old dispensation miss it? Stop right there. Then you have another wave of thinkers who began to paint a picture of this enigmatic persona of Jesus as pure delusion and fraud, the likes of Dominic Croissant and the Jesus Seminary or Seminar people. For them, it was nothing to tread on decades of solid scholarship to paint Jesus as nothing but a fraud, specifically about his death, and how they viewed his king or kingship was basically a brokerless kingdom. Zero, zilch, nothing to offer. According to people who, and I'm now going to say something that might freak a few out if you know who I'm going to talk about, N.T. Wright, who seems to be very solid and judicious for the most part in handling scripture, uh, when it came to the incarnate Christ, specifically on the concepts of king and kingdom, there's a lot left to be desired. At times, he left astute scholarship, refusing to acknowledge even the most basic tenets of our faith, including principles of the incarnation. So I always tell when people say, well, what, can you guide me towards something? The answer is no, I can't. I wish I could because so many of these scholars had so many valid points and so many interesting foci to look at, but many of them basically, whether it was, I'm going to say, bl blindsidedness or a lack of old and new put together, I can't say. I'm not in the position to. I just highlighted a few. But if a person is really interested in looking and understanding, as I said, you almost have to go and approach this with this mindset. When Jesus appeared on the scene, there was no, quote, Christianity yet. Christ had not died. Just this radical revolutionary and his small band of followers and to whom he would be speaking. Think of it this way. It's a Jewish audience. This is why the scripture says he came to his own and his own received him not. So for first century Judaism, it had hopes of a Messiah to come, and still to this day, by the way, hopes of a Messiah to come, but had nothing to do, this is the solid part, with our departed loved ones. They didn't view it that way, which, thank God, that's a good place. That's where we're in agreement. It was all about Israel's king, becoming God and ruling his people, the same king that would eventually vindicate his people, uh, had once covenanted with his people, promising them land and prosperity and basically everything else that was included in the Old Testament. But equally, even in the Old Testament, it says a greater than Moses would come to deliver them. So for those in antiquity, as those as those present day folks, why was God delaying in making good on his promise that he declared to his chosen people? Why was it taking so long if the concept of Messiah, King, and Kingdom could be crystallized? Why was it taking this long? Why the delay? Furthermore, in the Old Testament, God instituted many festivals and celebrations, Sabbaths in, in commemorative nature. And there are those that will reappear. For example, we can talk about the Sabbath and we can talk about things like the Feast of Tabernacles and specifically the Passover, which is celebrated as a memorial celebration, which has been decades and decades and decades of people just simply doing, carrying out a simple Seder celebration, commemorating a Passover. But the question is, to what end? And why? Is there a greater purpose to this? Now, I, I want to make sure that people listening to me understand I am not uh, anti-anything. I believe that I've said this before, and you've heard it echoed here over the years. If you are going to be something, whether you're Christian or Jew, know what you believe, live it, and be it. Do not live it in name only. And there's a whole lot of folks who live as Christians in name only. I know a whole lot of people who live as Jews in name only. So I don't want anyone to think that there's any uh, slight, have a lot of Jewish people who actually have come to the faith through this ministry, and some who are still cling to their Judaism, but listen on a regular basis. So I don't want anybody getting any ideas, but I am making a point that is confirmed in this book. So there's a perplexing question. 
When you read, for example, in the Old Testament, as the tabernacle begins to fade from the pages of the Bible, and we know that God's presence abided there within the tabernacle, and then, of course, Solomon's temple, and it says that God, God's presence was there as well. What would happen to future worship once the temple ceased to be? All of the practices, all of the traditions that are all wrapped up in this, what would that mean for Judaism? And what would that mean for adherence of simply of no New Testament, but people of the Old Testament? What would that mean? So the reason why I'm going here is because if you read the whole book, you realize that at some point the prophet Ezekiel specifically, although it happened in Solomon's day, but trace that right to Ezekiel, the glory of the Lord departed from the temple and with it the hope of a nation. And hear me well, I don't mean that people no longer hoped for Messiah to return. To this day, the Jews await their Messiah. So this also begins to fade as generations are born in captivity. And by the time a heathen king named Cyrus makes the decree at the time of Nehemiah and Ezra that the people could come back and return, it was a very small number of, those, of all those who were carried away into captivity and exiled. It was a very small number that came back. And we know from the reading of both Ezra and Nehemiah that even the tongue, the language of the people had been forgotten, let alone some, when Ezra brought out the book of the law, were hearing it for the first time they had never heard before. So it's important to understand, first of all, God's word, as the psalm says, is forever settled in heaven. It has not ceased to be. It's actually, think of this, almost a miracle that God's word has survived. He made it survive. It's, it is his gift to humankind. Unfortunately, many turned a blind eye to it. But if we tend to hear the word law, we probably don't think that the law was divinely established by a sovereign, and that it's beginning, this is the beginning of asking how these people, these same people, could not, within their own scriptures, once Christ came on the scene, not see that this was the beginning of the fulfillment of King, Messiah, and Kingdom. Now, once we begin to examine the statements in the New Testament, and there's a lot of them, this is what's amazing. You have these statements such as, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I didn't even want to go into the language, but that word at hand, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, in the Greek is indicative, which means factual. It is in the present, and it's active. In other words, when John the Baptist made that declaration about Christ, Basically, he was pointing to what is here now. The initiation of the kingdom has begun. The kingdom itself has not been established as it will be at his second coming. But the initiation, per se, had already started. So it's interesting to see even, and I, I challenge you to think of this in a different way, even the prayer that he taught his disciples to pray, which is always mis labeled as the Lord's Prayer. It is not. It is the disciples' prayer. Within it, thy kingdom come. Think about that. The disciples are told to pray, essentially, bring it on. But we don't, we don't pray it like that. We don't even conceive of it like that. Thy kingdom come. That Christ was instructing his disciples. Now, Part of the commission will be go out and preach the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. I do not want to get hung up on the distinction between the two because at their core, with slight differences, they are one and the same. I believe, for example, in Matthew's case, he did not write kingdom of God because as a Hebrew writer, as one of the mindset coming out of that frame, God's name too holy to write, too holy to say, it would behoove him to say kingdom of heaven. But there, there are subtle differences in different ways that it is used. I don't want to just lump it all together. So again, I ask the question, if we begin to peel back and look at the proof, how could this be missed by so many? And even today, 
The thing that's frustrating to me is I believe that there are people who still don't get it. There was a preacher who died in a plane accident, I'm going to say probably some 10 years ago, who started a doctrine, and it's a damnable one, called the Kingdom Now. And every lunatic who didn't read the Bible jumped on the bandwagon, oh, the Kingdom Now, the Kingdom's within you. Well, okay, to some degree that is true, but not the way it was being taught. There is something more to come. This is the unfortunate part. If you live your life here as if there's nothing more, then I guess there may be nothing more for you. But if you live your life down here understanding this, all of this every Sunday, every time you pray, you read, you study, is preparation for that kingdom, for entering into that kingdom, and you look at it with those eyes. You're not looking at it as some future distant time that may or may not realize in your lifetime. No, it will not be in this body, in this lifetime, but it will be. And failure to recognize that is part and parcel of what I basically say is the myopic view of my Jewish friends. Failure to see that God has promised infinitely more than just life right here as we know it and as we live it. That's very important for me. Now, there's, there are other parts to this that I will highlight if I have enough time, but if you want to think of it this way, the question has to be asked, we read the, the New Testament, Jesus is on the scene, and maybe for some Jesus was a radical revolutionary and his preachings were unbelievably stretched far out of the mind's eye of what perhaps the rigid Torah spoke about. But to the vast multitudes that gathered to hear him. He spoke with authority, with power, with knowledge of things that no human being, in terms of a religious leader, has ever done unless they are, of course, a nut. And so it's mind-boggling. In John 8:56, I'm not staying there, but if you want to see it for yourself, Jesus says, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad in it. That statement's kind of mind-boggling because if you analyze all that followed from Abraham to Christ is not, nor can it ever be, separate as a separate act away from or a new addition, something added on to what was already there. God was already, had. if you even want to go back further into Genesis and what we call the Proto-Evangelium uh, in Genesis 3.15, already prefiguring Christ. So it's kind of mind-boggling, but even the terminology that Jesus uses, seed of Abraham, son of David, firstborn of the Lord, and just if you just look, for example, quickly in the book of Isaiah, you find his threefold office of prophet, priest, and king, all bound up in language of servant and son. And this is why I, I, I it kind of makes me, I just, I just put my hands up like that. How imperfectly Israel could fail to understand these scriptures and look to him. And that's why, interestingly enough, the prophet Zechariah lifts that up and says, at a future time, when he comes again, when Christ returns here, they will look upon him whom they've pierced and they will mourn. They will recognize at that time who he was when he was here and who he is at his return. That's what's staggering. Now, I believe many of his disciples didn't understand about the kingdom. And that's not a shame. I would say we are much like the disciples. Sometimes we we see things clearly, and other times, like the scripture says, we see things through, through a glass darkly. So let's just say when they asked him, who then is the greatest in the kingdom? That's quite a question to ask. I want you to just kind of think on that. These are familiar scriptures. But to ask Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom? 
That takes audacity. That takes somebody thinking perhaps they would qualify for that or there's some specific qualification. When in fact, Jesus turns to them and he says, except you become here, well, let's turn there so those who are not familiar with the passage, it's important to me that people know what I'm quoting is not coming out of a hat somewhere or other parts. <laughs> You'd be surprised, friends. Matthew 18. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And who shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Now just stop right there. And it, it says kind of in a nutshell, who then can enter or how does one enter except you turn and become as little children. A child is curious in nature. And some of you who have young children, I'm, I'm speaking of me because I'm the person who asks the most questions in the room probably, but y young children typically will ask questions and can just rifle them off and it, they're nonstop. How are Right? Okay. There's also a natural expression and inquiry, a curious mind. And something else that I would highlight, which is children, especially if they're asking their parents, they're unjaded, they're unscathed, they haven't yet had the experience of false information or lies or things that are disingenuous. So when Jesus says, except you become as one of these, except you be converted and come, become as one of these, he's not saying become childlike and act like a child. He's saying basically this mindset, the simplicity of all of this. And there's no crime. I want to make clear there's no crime. There's never been a crime. There's never any time where we're told to not ask questions. In fact, I think for the last few weeks, I've said the more questions you ask, the more questions you have. And just when you think you've probed to a depth of knowledge and understanding, here come more questions. We can look at a text, and as I'm going to do in a minute, we can look at a text that we have visited many times. And in revisiting it, there's a certain, I want to say, maturity in handling the text. Each time you, you visit and you dig, the first time you might see it in very simplistic and very ABC fashion. But the next time you come back, you see things you didn't see. You see other things that leap off the page right at you. But in the course of revisiting, you find out that maybe the very essence of what you needed to know you didn't know the first, second, third time around. It only becomes clear as you keep revisiting. And that's why I have no shame when I touch on these passages. And I want to highlight one important thing before I even go on, which is I'm talking about this subject because, yes, Easter is coming up, and there'll be people who will appear in this church for their once-a-year appearance in a church. That's their doff of the hat to God when in fact that is the greatest tragedy. You know, some people, well, aren't, shouldn't you be happy if somebody comes in for Easter? You know, well, yeah, that's, that's better than nothing, but that's not going to help you learn about king and kingdom, about the one who, if we understand who we are, we have already entered into. And we are not like the Old Testament in covenant format, but in the New Testament, this being the last words of Christ. We've already entered into a realm being his children and the kingdom, as I said, being initiated, not yet established per se, but initiated. So it's important for me because treating this subject in hopes that people will hear before Easter might get people to just say, maybe I need to spend a little bit more time on this. See, most people treat God and the church and studying God's word particularly as a back burner item that's completely unimportant. 
And I'm going to tell you something. Those folks are going to be very surprised. You know the scripture that says, depart from me, I never knew. Lord, Lord, didn't we do thus and so? Depart from me, I never knew you. Now, God is not expecting us to perfectly wrap our minds around and be perfect in every way of the book. But if you and I don't take the time to learn who, and I'll say it like this, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is, if you don't take the time to understand what this kingdom looks like, in fact, so many parables in this book referring to the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, go back and in your own time you begin to read how many of these and there's a lot, which means if there are that many focuses on the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, it says, coming out of the Lord's mouth, there's something really important for us as it's being repeated so often that we might want to pay attention to. And it's not simply in the act of reading it, it's in the act of understanding what it should all mean. Now, I'm going to take you to a familiar passage that highlights something else. That is in John 3. We've been here many times before. I don't want you to think that I'm going to re-preach an old message, but we're going to revisit John 3 and Nicodemus for a reason. And I want you to see something which I had not really highlighted before myself. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So now I want you to go back to what I said at the beginning to see and understand Jesus from a Jewish frame, which would be completely radical or rejected, or for those who had the capacity, and I say the capacity, to look on him with some sort of faith, there would be an opening of the eyes. So imagine this Nicodemus who's obviously a religious man. The same came to Jesus by night, said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, and I've taught on this before, that word is from above. It's being used to say except that God birthed that new life into you he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, get this picture real clear. Nicodemus, who is steeped in Judaism, rabbinic teaching and tradition, this would completely oppose any teaching he himself had received. In other words, a person can't even begin to understand about the kingdom, to even see or perceive or understand except that God acts first preveniently. That we call that prevenient grace. And that's a subject I've spoken of many times before. So we know something about Nicodemus that eventually will be revealed later. It's Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea that go to beg for the body of Christ to be taken down off the cross to give him a proper burial. That should speak volumes in and of itself of if this was just a, seen as a, a revolutionary lunatic, why beg for the body, why give him a proper burial? In fact, if he's that much of a fraud and a weirdo, leave him rot, right? So you have to kind of get the mindset. This would have shaken everything at the core of what Nicodemus had ever known. And I think that What's important here is that we understand we are no different than Nicodemus. When we come into the church or when we come into trying to understand, we think that the rigid exercises of exterior performance, what we know in the New Testament is called works of the flesh, are what will get us in. This is why I, it pains me every time I speak with some of my Catholic friends and they're so busy with works and with wrapping up, the, checking the boxes on the outside, but the inside still remains vacant of this concept. And if anyone cares for souls, it's a tragedy 
to hear somebody say, I am a good person, I do good things. No, you're not, and neither am I. In fact, truth be told, if we're really honest with ourselves, and you've heard me say this so many times, we are rotten at the core. And the only thing that makes us good is the fact that we've looked upon him who died for our sins, who has washed and cleansed us and made us whole. That is the only saving, redeeming part, which is not of our nature, of our own. Our righteousness is this filthy rag. So get that in your mind. I know it's so hard for so many people who will be exactly like Nicodemus, shaken at the core. How could this possibly be? Now, if you analyze, there are close to 120 occurrences of the expression use the kingdom of, and I don't want to get into the minutiae of God or heaven, many times carrying with it the meaning of the rule of God, which has now been revealed in the person of Christ, sometimes revealed through the church, not the physical building, but the people who belong to the Lord, sometimes of its unfolding hindrances, other times of his second coming as king of kings, and the rest of the references to the kingdom being perfected in the world to come. Now, I'm going to ask this because there are still many Nicodemuses in the sound of my voice, still not believing that there's something else, and it's not some imaginary la-la land. If a person comes to this point where you're actually listening to me and you're reading these words, please pay attention. For a religious man, a man of the Pharisees, a ruler of the Jews. That means steeped in tradition, steeped in the law, knowing exactly what God's word says, asks basically how. How can a man be born when he's old? And how can he enter in a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And obviously misses the boat. So Jesus has to explain, verily, verily, I send to thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So Two things we have here, except that he be born from above, he cannot see, and born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter in. You couple that with what is said of, except you become, except you be converted and become as one of these, and you have enough information to know. We're not walking blindly into this, but it becomes apparent that we cannot do this. The initiation of it does not happen on our own. And you've heard me say this so many times, so I think it's very commonplace to you and most of my listeners, but there are, there's a world of people out there, I'm just going to say it, who are being misled, not just by priest, pastor, minister. They're being misled by the world, by if you even want to trust whatever you see in the media or whatever you read, which I scrutinize and I basically am repulsed by most of what I see. But the problem is people are not necessarily looking for this as an answer. They would prefer to have something that is so crystal clear and very A, B, C, D, E, F, G that I don't have to think about it anymore. I can just check the box and I can go. And therein lies the problem. If a person is not willing to acknowledge this activity begins, here's a religious man. You'd think he's already been touched by God. No, because you can be religious in spirit. You could be a Jew, a Muslim, a Christian, religious in spirit. And I don't mean having the spirit, but letter of the law person and not yet received what he's talking about, born from above. I cannot explain it to you. The late Dr. Gene Scott used to say, I believe in the born-again experience. And forgive me, because I'm, I think I've said this before, and I mean no disrespect, but that's not even a right statement. It cannot be, I believe in the born-again experience. It must be, you all, we all must be born again. It's mandatory for all. That's the missing ingredient here. I don't care if you grew up in the Catholic Church, or if you grew up outside the Church, or you grew up with some form of something. What the king of kings is saying right here is basically, I control the kingdom. And you must look to me, not me, him. So 
Here's something else to understand. I think that Nicodemus could understand the B in order to become, but how would that work? Remember, he, he says here, how can a man when he's born or when he's old, how can he go back a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Jesus answers him and says, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter in. That means no, no capacity to enter in into the kingdom of God. Now, some have taken this to say, well, you, you must be baptized. You must receive the Spirit. This is true. And by the way, no one can come to God except that the Spirit does that certain activity. You might be entertained by it initially, but to come and to be connected, that is God's Spirit in a person basically being activated. Without that, it's not going to happen no matter what you do. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. From above, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but thou canst tell whence it cometh and whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. I can't tell you the mystery of this. I can't. I can't tell you why some people come and are so gripped and have such a hunger and such a desire and a quest, and they, they get into the book, and I've seen this before. I've seen it in all walks of life. I saw it in the jails and the prisons. Some had just plenty of time, and this was their, their way of killing time because there's not too much else to do. And others, it was truly a hunger and truly a passion. I've seen it in churches when I've gone to speak. I've seen it with people where they're so, they are so gripped by this book. And we're not talking about lunatics and people who are <laughs> overtly crazy perfectionists or fundamentalists. I'm talking about people who get gripped by the Word of God, like most of my listening audience. And you can't explain it. In fact, to most people, it wouldn't make sense. So Jesus gives this concept, and Nicodemus answers and said to him, how can these things be? And this is what's really important. He just basically told him what he needs to know. But he still has the question, how can these things be? And that's okay, as I'm going to say again, except you become converted and become as one of these, referring to a child. And a child would ask a question like this, how can this be? How does this work? We're not talking about God put everything out there as tangible proof, but how can this be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Ver verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. Now this is a strange, I think the King James doesn't do too much justice, but think of it this way. He says, if I've told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe it if I tell you of heavenly things? And this, he goes into something that I'm going to highlight in a minute. He says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And launches straightway into something that even for Nicodemus would have left Nicodemus as dumb and silent as the rest of his religion. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Don't stop there that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, very interesting. This man of Galilee, king of kings, but if you want to call him right now simply as Nicodemus does, rabbi, is highlighting something in a very discreet way of something that Nicodemus would surely know about. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, well, go to that chapter in Numbers 21, because there I want to show you something which you can read and you can miss real quickly. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. Now stop right there. 
These were people, this is what blows my mind about all this. These were people who witnessed manna, those light round wafers falling to the ground every day as provision for them as food in the wilderness. I'm sorry, I'm just going to tell you something. If, if I was in that day and I witnessed that with my own eyes, <laughs> I'd be like, uh, okay, say no more, because whatever's happening here, I don't know, this can't be magic. But they were witnessed, not just, this is not the only miracle that they saw, they were witnessed and privy to so many miraculous events, provisions, and happenings, including the fact that God and I'm glad I'm not God because God sent a pillar, cloud, and, and fire to guide them as his presence. For me, these people constantly murmuring and complaining, I would have said, screw it. You made your bed in the wilderness, sleep there. I'm done with you. And I, don't, I still don't understand to this day, but they were witness to all of this. And... The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, a brazen serpent, set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, put it upon a pole. It came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, that is what Jesus is referencing to Nicodemus. And anyone who, prior to Christ's coming, could not, all the rabbis, if you comb all the rabbinic literature, all of the commentaries, could not make sense of this passage. This is why I said to you, if you think you're going to read the Old Testament and not see Christ repeatedly over and over or the pattern or type leading us to look at him, because that's exactly what happened. The people came to Moses and said, we have sinned for we have spoken against the Lord. Just the very, the very act, which in the New Testament is called repentance, they prayed and asked in a repentant, humbled way to Moses. And God's provision was to set a brazen serpent upon a pole. That even if it says that one is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Typifying the power that Christ would have at a future time. Simply in that passage that we just looked at in John 3, something being said there without saying it in the Nicodemus of how, just as the brazen serpent had to be looked upon by the people who were bitten and would have surely died without that, we are to look upon the Son of Man lifted up, and by faith looking at him being lifted up, we too, in dying sinfully, we being bitten, if you will, by sin and by the sting of death shall live and not die because of him. Centuries of studies, of rabbinic studies, could not make sense of this, and yet Jesus lifts this up. And if you read the, the end of that saying in John 3, you cannot read, you can't stop. You'll see verse 14, the Son of Man must be lifted up, or the Son of Man be lifted up with semicolon right there that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now let me just explain one thing. This is a great disservice that anybody who has a Bible like mine, all these words are in red, and they shouldn't be. What ends with the words of Christ begins in verse 15 with actually the words of John, not the words of Christ. As you read carefully, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, this would have not come out of Christ's mouth. This was, again, if you think about it, when John was writing, how the flow of the story being told, and then John picks up with his words. They did a great disservice in doing it this way. But it still must be read in context. You know, everywhere you go, you'll see John 
For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Read what comes before. God must initiate your entrance, your first seeing the kingdom. He also must initiate your entering in. We act by faith and therefore that initiation is commenced and will be finalized when he comes again. No matter what state a person may be in through time as it speeds up to that time. So it is very important that we do not fail to see, especially because here is one clear example of the king explaining the kingdom of God. See, only one who rules that kingdom could properly explain the method of entering in. And we know in many cases Jesus spoke with, not in many cases, in all cases, spoke with one who had authority, who had knowledge of things that no other person in the scene, on the scene of history could have knowledge of, like his insight or his knowledge into the kingdom. Why? Because it is his kingdom. So even for the seer, the same one who, whose name is opposed to this John who writes the book of Revelation, the seer on the Isle of Patmos, it, the visions had to come from the one who gives the vision to see, to see the future kingdom, to, to see the future destruction, to see the battle of Armageddon, to see the second coming and the kingdom established on your earth with Christ reigning for a thousand years. So all of these things become important. You may not like what I'm going to say, especially you people out there who listen on TV land, but until we come back as a people, I'm not talking about fundamentalists. I'm not talking about the lunatics who go and do all kinds of crazy things in the name of Jesus. I'm talking about just as I've taught, just as I've spoken to you, just as I am. I'm, I'm a person like any other with passions and natures just like any other, with sinful behavior like any other, that falls short like any other. But I look to this book and I look unto him who I know is my only hope of salvation and has given me what I call the initial deposit to enter into the kingdom when he comes again. And if you think for a second, this is what, what really flusters me. If you think for a second that I'm a lunatic standing here and telling you about this, so many passages in this book, in the Old Testament, speak of when he returns. They tell me, Without ambiguity, without, I have to think about this for a second. It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. That is the seat of Jerusalem where Christ shall reign and the throne of David where David once more will sit. But we don't speak about the resurrection of those saints memorialized in this book, but they will be remembered for their faith, and they, will be, they too will be raised up. This is what the book of Revelation talks about, the saints. Not just, don't think about it in the Catholic way. Sorry, friends. And many people shall go and say, come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for out of Zion shall shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among the nations, shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That's talking about a future time. There are so many of these verses. All you've got to do is read what's said about in the, book of in the book of Ezekiel when it talks about land being granted there is no, the temple that is spoken of in Ezekiel doesn't yet exist. And the land that will be apportioned to the tribes doesn't yet exist as we know it. It exists geographically. But make no mistake, all of what's yet to happen is laid out in, in Zechariah when it says, when his feet touch down on the Mount of Olives, then topographically the landscape will be changed. Things will things that we cannot really fathom right now because they sound too fantastic. 
But if the prophecies of a child being born to a virgin were materialized, and if the prophecies, and we could, I could pick apart every single prophecy that pointed to the birth of Christ, to the coming King, Savior, Messiah, have been in part realized at the coming of Christ. You go back into Isaiah and you read about Isaiah 50, 53, about this suffering servant who could be none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. You'd have to be not willing to look at that passage, Jew or Gentile, to not see the Lord Jesus Christ right there. And all of the song, servant songs within Isaiah, you read about Daniel and it talks about a kingdom being established, an everlasting kingdom. And you come into the book of Revelation and you see what is being unfolded there as a future time until he comes. The calamity that will occur on this earth, I haven't spoken much about this, it will be terrible. So why I talk about this now is because, as I said, I do see so many people that come into the church that are much like Nicodemus. They have a religious mindset without recognizing, without God acting preveniently and opening up the gates of your eyes or the ability for your heart to be opened up to receive this word, you could be kicking against something for the rest of your life and it will not happen until he initiates it. And when he does, this is the other thing that I would say, unlike those who are familiar with the whole Old Testament and yet wore blinders at the appearance of Christ. And as I quoted already, John lifted this up and said he came to his own and his own received him not. The prophecies that were fulfilled just in his birth in a young age until his public ministry, all of these checked off. We could go to types, shadows and types, where he fulfills every type of the tabernacle, everything that's within the tabernacle, with, with the exception of two or three items in their concepts. And everything through this book that points to him. So for this generation, for a people coming up who may not have any religious background, they may not have any understanding of the Bible. The time is not eternal, and time is winding down. Now, whether that means we're here for another 100 years or another 500 years, these, my friends, are the last days. Don't let anyone tell you the last days represent a set time that must happen within six months. The last days have already commenced. When you see just what this nation, that is, by the way, prophesied of, like other nations, supposed to be a nation of blessings. But how can this nation be blessed when it will not recognize there is a sovereign ruler and a kingdom yet to come, and the seed of that kingdom will not be here? But failure to recognize that has brought us into a world of hurt where, as I said, everything gets commingled and seemingly no one seems to care about one specific thing. What will happen in the future? That's already been written in the book. And your names and my name, and I say it like this, forgive me, may or may not be in the, in the Lamb's book. That's up to you to work out with God. All I can tell you is there will be a lot of people who haven't been instructed, who have not been taught, who've never so much pondered king and kingdom. And as I said, Easter will come around and some will come into the church disappointed that I haven't talked about Easter eggs and if we're having a bunny hunt here or whatever else they want to do in some other stupid situation. When the fact is the core, center, and circumference of our faith revolves around the risen Christ and his return. And that risen Christ that we read of, that I look to, that Jesus tried to point to Nicodemus to say, we must look to him, brings me back to one simple concept to wrap this message up, which is this. In a time of great uncertainty in which we live, and by the way, if you do listen to the news, it's catered to fear-mongering. 
It's catered to try and make people afraid and scared. And we who are people of the book and people of faith, I refuse. I'm sorry, I will not go down into this hunker down, be afraid, get scared, because the God that I serve, the God of this book, the God who has been the God who changes not, does not advocate that we buckle under some circumstance, but being people of faith, faith that supposedly is able to move mountains, faith that is able to, in the face of adversity, say, I will not even go there, because I know in whom I have believed, in whom I have put my trust, in whom I have lived my life as a living testimony. And that testimony is not, you, you can believe whatever you want, you can be like some of these scholars and ignore and all I have to say to you, for those who choose to ignore, you don't want to hear, we shall see. We shall all see. Because equally, those who are, as I've said many times, in Christ, Romans 8 declares there is therefore now no ultimate condemnation. That means we live as sinners saved by grace. And as the time comes, and as our time is, whatever that is, we shall enter in with him at that time, not being judged upon acts because it's all covered by the blood. But there is another judgment for those people who've refused him, who have rejected him, who have vehemently made a choice that this could not be so. They too shall be judged. There'll be people, by the way, in a period that is a scary time when you read the book of Revelation, there'll be people that will still be in the tribulation period being saved in the earth. And those people may have a different place or a different ascription, if you will, of judgment. I can't say that's to be determined by God. But if today is the day you hear his voice, and I'm not speaking of my voice or his voice through me, but through his word, I suggest you start getting real. This is not some technique to make people get afraid. This is some technique to make people come to the faith and recognize you have time yet and time to redeem to come to know this king, savior, and that one who will rule the kingdom if you will be a part of it. It starts with faithing and trusting him now. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.